This is a little um, video just to kind of explain um, two of our types of bonding. We have metallic and ionic today. Let's first start by discussing what a chemical bond is. And so this is when atoms are held together by attractive electrical forces. Usually this is um, either by sharing electrons between the two atoms or atoms fully transferring electron from one to another, creating charges that are opposite and they want to be together for be, uh, because opposites attract. So we have four main types of bonds. We have metallic bonds, ionic bonds, then we have molecular polar bonds and molecular nonpolar bonds. Sometimes you'll see molecular being referred to as covalent. These words are just interchangeable. So a metallic bond um, happens in between metals, and as we know, metals don't really like to hold on to their electrons. So if we have metal atoms um, in a pattern, which we call a crystal lattice, they have these electrons just kind of get to float freely all over the place. So we say it kind of looks like this sea of electrons with these little metal boats just kind of sticking all over the place. So the atom is like this boat and then it's kind of floating on all of these electrons that are able to move all over the place. So these electrons are shared freely. This is what allows the electrons to move towards a charged thing or it allows electricity to flow through metals. Ionic bonding is very important in chemical reactions, and these are when electrons are fully transferred between a metal to a nonmetal. And these are the only types of bonding um, between metals and nonmetals. So, um, as we know, met metals like to give up their electrons very easily, nonmetals like to take electrons. Um, so, we have this transfer of electrons. It gives us two completely charged atoms, and these atoms like to be together. So um, we have very specific names for the atoms once they become charged. If they are positively charged, they're called the cation. And I kind of noticed this because the cation has a T for a plus sign if you want to help remember it that way and then the anion is negative and I say an for negative there's an extra in it in in that one so um, you have your cation and your anion are um, two words that we talk about when we're using ionic bonding and that refers to the cation is positive and the anion is negative so here is a good picture of what is going on when we have um, our particles being charged. So in this case, the atom A is going to give its electrons to B. So A becomes positive and B becomes negative. Well, it's not just these two forming a bond. What we see is um, all of the negatives want to be next to the positives, and all the positives want to be next to the negatives, so they form this crystal lattice. Basically, this just means that all of the little pieces are kind of stuck together, and they form a pattern when they do this. Naming and formula writing for ionic compounds, it's going to be a little bit tedious at first, but once you figure it out, it goes pretty smoothly. So when you're looking at the formulas, which I have a sample over here, it's very easy to name them. You just say uh, the first name is normal, it's the metal, so in the first example we have Na, a sodium, and then uh, the second one, the nonmetal, is gets an IDE ending. So instead of Br being bromine, we're going to say bromide. So this one is sodium bromide. The next one we have calcium oxide, aluminum sulfide, magnesium iodide, potassium nitride, and barium chloride. And if you notice, the aluminum sulfide has a 2 and a 3 involved, but that doesn't really matter when we're just naming because we're just looking at the aluminum and the sulfide. Going the other way, we do need to pay attention to those numbers and we do need to pay attention to those charges. So we have lithium chloride 
and we'll go ahead and write down those ions that they generally make. So lithium is in the first column of the periodic table. It gets a plus one charge. Chloride, or chloride is in the second to last row of the periodic table, so it gets a minus one charge. So we see that the lithium has given one electron away to the chlorine, and the chlorine has taken one electron. So these balance each other out, and when we write the formula, we write LiCl. Magnesium oxide, our magnesium is going to be a plus two because it's in the second column of the periodic table, and oxygen is going to be a minus two. This means that two electrons from magnesium are going to be transferred over to an oxygen, and oxygen only needs two electrons, so these two balance each other out, and they would just be MgO. Beryllium and phosphide aren't as nice as the other two in their balancing out. Beryllium is a plus two, which means it gives two electrons away, and phosphorus is a minus three, which means it takes three electrons. So this is going to take a little bit of drawing. So I have here the valence electrons for beryllium and phosphorus. And now beryllium is going to take, or going to give, its two electrons over here to phosphorus. But phosphorus isn't happy, that only gives it seven. So we need to bring in another beryllium. This beryllium is going to give one of its electrons to phosphorus, making that phosphorus happy. But beryllium still has this extra electron floating around. It needs to go somewhere. So we're gonna have to bring in another phosphorus to balance that out. So this electron is going to come over to the phosphorus. Now, both of our beryllium's are happy. Our first phosphorus is happy, but the second phosphorus is still missing some. So we need to bring in another beryllium. This beryllium is able to give both of its electrons to the phosphorus. Now, all of our beryllium's have given away the electrons that they want, and both of our phosphorus have collected the electrons that they need. So we have three beryllium's and two phosphorus combined to form beryllium phosphide. Not all of the ones that don't match have to go through that much trouble. For example, zinc is a plus two and iodine is a minus one. This means that zinc is going to get rid of two electrons while iodine is going to take one electron. That means we're going to need two iodines to take those electrons off of zinc, giving us the formula ZnI2. Gallium is a plus three and fluoride is a minus one. So we are going to need three fluorines to take those three electrons off of gallium since each fluorine can only take one at a time. Rubidium is in the first column of the periodic table. It's a plus charge. And nitrogen is a minus three. This means that nitrogen wants three electrons, but rubidium can only give one apiece. So we're gonna need three rubidiums to balance the nit or to give its electrons to the nitrogen. So when we um, go from words to formulas, we have to look at this charged step. So we're going to have to write out the charges and see how many of each we need to balance each other out. Next we're going to talk about what happens when we have polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are treated just like any other ion, except for this is a grouping of atoms. So polyatomic literally means many atoms. So let's look at the example that we have. So we have potassium and nitrite. If we draw out their valence electrons, like we have for the previous ones, we will see that potassium has one valence electron. And then our nitrite 
since it's a minus one charge, it acts very similarly to fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all of those with the negative charges. So it really acts like the whole grouping has seven valence electrons that want that one other valence electron from the potassium. So in this case, when we go to name them, we just say potassium nitrite. A second example would be magnesium nitrate. If we have magnesium nitrite, uh, magnesium would be a plus two, and nitrite is a minus one. Drawing the um, electrons for the electron diagram for this one, we would have magnesium with two electrons and NO2 with its ability to take one, so having seven valence electrons. One of the magnesium electrons can come here, but we still have an extra electron on magnesium, so we need another nitrate to take that. So for this one, we need two sets of NO2 to go with magnesium. To write this out, we would have our normal Mg, and then we would have two NO2s. If we write it like this, it kind of looks like we have 22 oxygens instead of two NO2 groups, so we need to put NO2 in parentheses. So this says that magnesium needs two NO2 groups to be um, to balance out those charges. Okay, so the last part of naming ionic uh, compounds or doing formula writing for ionic compounds is looking at the transition metals. And those are the ones that are in the middle of the periodic table. If you're looking at mine in the classroom, it's that dark pink or dark purple and light purple area. Um, if you're looking at your colored copy of it, it's, the, it's that short stack in the middle. It starts with uh, column three and kind of moves to the right. These atoms, um, they're electrons aren't in just circular orbitals anymore. You don't have that eight is great rule. So really, they can give off differing amounts of electrons. Sometimes they give off two, sometimes they give off one, and sometimes even up to four. This all depends on the environment, how fast those electrons are moving, so their speed, their heat. Um, it also deals with what they're combining with, how much that other thing wants those electrons. So for example, we have PB, which is lead. And lead um, has the ability to either give off two electrons or four electrons. Well, that kind of changes how we need to name this uh, because um, lead oxide with two electrons would just be PBO and lead oxide when lead is giving off four would be PBO2. So we kind of need to differentiate between those two and how we do that is we use Roman numerals. Now don't freak out about Roman numerals. Um, I'm only asking you to look at one, two, three, and four. I won't have you do anything more than that. So for lead two, we are gonna use um, the Roman numeral two to signify those two electrons that have been given off. For lead four, we are gonna use the Roman numeral four to show that four electrons left. So now we need to look at um, naming a compound. So for example, we have PBO. All right, we have to figure out what the charge is on PB, so that way we can pick out this Roman numeral. Um, to do this, you need to look at the charge of the nonmetal. So we have oxygen. If you look at your periodic table, you know that oxygen um, is a minus two charge. Since PB and O balance each other out and they only need one of each, that means those two electrons that went to oxygen came from lead and only two came from lead. So lead was a plus two. So to name this, we are going to use the Roman numeral 2 to say lead gave two electrons away. So we would write this out as lead 2 oxide. 
Our next example is going and writing the formula. So we have chromium-3 chloride. So that 3 means that chromium had a plus 3 charge. And we know that chlorine, um, chloride is a minus 1 charge. So chromium is going to give off 3 electrons. Chlorine can only take one electron, so we're going to need three chlorines to balance that out or to take those three electrons. So here I've also added the little um, Lewis diagram to show that chromium is giving off those three electrons to three different chlorine atoms.